which is the water program that I run. Next slide, please. Awesome. So some more background on me. Um, I was actually born in Tucson. My background is all in earth science and geology and hydrology, but I've now transitioned into working in conservation. Um, I used to work for state parks and some other places, and in my free time, I volunteer with the Southern Arizona Rescue Association and the National Cave Rescue Commission. So that's some other things that I'm up to. Uh, next slide. To introduce you more to the organization that I'm talking about. Oh wait, let's go back one. Yeah. So Sky Island Alliance, our mission is to protect and restore the diversity of life and lands in the Sky Island region of the U.S. and Mexico. You might be thinking to yourself, what is the Sky Island region of the U.S. and Mexico? So on our next slide, we actually show that region. So this is a map you can see of southern Arizona and northern Mexico. And that area that's in red, you can see that any of these, sorry, I'm not quite sure which one to point towards, but any of these regions, uh, this is the Sky Island region. It's made up of more than 50 different mountain ranges that essentially act like little islands among a sea of deserts. What's cool about this is that it also acts biologically like islands. Like you can imagine animals and plants on all of these different islands are all separated by the oceans. Similarly here, for animals to move through this, these corridors, they kind of go from mountain range to mountain range. And this particular figure shows that our region has influences from the Sonoran Desert, the Rocky Mountains, the Great Plains, the Sierra Madre, and even tropical, we have some tropical species. So on that right side there, you can see we have saguaros, aspen trees, we've got deer, we have ocelots. And then next slide, if any of you follow our work, last week we were able to announce that we also saw a jaguar on one of our cameras. This part of the world is the only part of the world where you can find jaguar and black bear in the same habitats. It is a really, really cool place to live and work and ride. All right, next slide. Um, and just a kind of an overview of that, you all are probably familiar with this. When you go out on rides and you are up in elevation and down in elevation, you move through a lot of different plant communities as well. From desert scrub down here with the saguaros, ironwoods, palaveries, ocotillo, all the way up through to fir forest. We don't really have a lot of fir forest down in the southern part of the state, but there are some sky islands that actually get tall enough that they can have firs on the top. Next slide. Awesome. So to tell you more about the program that I come from is our Spring Seeker program. Um, on the left-hand side of this image, you can see again that same sky island boundary, this time in light gray. And all of those blue dots are known water sources across the region. The dark blue dots are actually natural springs, and the light blue dots are either historic springs that we learned about off of old maps, and it's on stock tanks as well. So what's interesting about this whole region is that we don't have that many rivers and lakes. And so if you imagine that you are a jaguar or even a human migrating across this whole landscape, there's not a lot of water out there for you, right? But we have more than 4,000 natural springs on the north side of the border, and we think just as many on the southern side of the border in Mexico. We just don't know quite where they are because we don't have as good data down there. So this whole region probably has close to 10,000 natural springs. Um, our goal is to get eyes on as many of those springs as possible so that we can understand their condition, we can understand if there are any threats towards those springs, and we can potentially take restoration actions to be able to protect those sites into the future. So the program I'm going to talk about uh, is about, it's called Spring Seeker. We've done about 1,400 surveys already of those sites, which is a huge, huge number of springs that people have gone and seen just in the last three years. Next slide. So I do want to back up and talk a little bit more about what a spring even is. So what do you all think? When I say spring, what does that bring to mind for you? Water. 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 Yep, yeah. that's number one. Anything else? Flowers. Flowers? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Animals? Yeah, bringing in all these different plants, animals. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so the official definition of a spring is just a place where water emerges at the surface. But obviously, in a place like the desert, it does support these incredibly complex and biodiverse plant and animal communities. So next slide. We have a couple of different types of springs in our region. Scientists have classified these into 12 different kinds, and I'm not going to go through all 12. Um, but the most important one for the southern part of the state is these Rio Creed springs. I remember that because Rio sounds like Rio, like in Spanish, like river. These are ones that come out in riverbeds. So these are like 
50 to 70 percent of the springs actually pop out in riverbeds. So if you're ever riding along riverbeds and you see water, it's probably one of these Rio Green springs. Next slide. We also have some places where springs just pop out on the sides of hills. Uh, these are called, very predictably, hill slope springs. Uh, these make up about 25% of the spring types. They're a little bit harder to find because there's nothing like to draw you there necessarily, but, uh, but yeah, that makes it about 25% of our springs. And, next. and then we also have <laughs> these meadow or Cienega springs. So thinking about like Cienega Creek, someone was already mentioning, I think, to me tonight. Um, and then there's some other Cienegas around the San Pedro Valley. All of these are also different types of springs where water kind of diffusely comes up in these meadow environments. Next slide. And then these are all other kinds. We don't have a lot of geysers here in Arizona, but that would be really cool. Um, we do have a lot of hanging gardens, like if you think about the Grand Canyon, where you have those beautiful, beautiful walls where the water's kind of coming, cascading down. Um, but all these aren't really that important in our area, unfortunately. We mostly just have those riverbed ones, those hill slope ones, and then those meadow ones. Next slide. So I've kind of touched on this already, but springs are important because they kind of are like rest stops for wildlife. So as animals are migrating through this region, uh, they have to stop for water. We have a lot of riparian plants and animals that you can only find at springs. Think about the last time you were under cottonwoods or sycamore trees you're probably right next to water. Like those are some plants that really require that extra water. We also have a lot of spring endemic species. So what that means is species that are found only at springs. Um, particularly a lot of tiny little snails, some types of fish that you wouldn't expect. We often find at these springs that we don't find anywhere else on the landscape. Obviously springs are also important for recreation. We go out and we you know, filter water and drink water from springs. We, uh, our cattle, our livestock also use springs. And then there's also a, a, a hypothesis out there right now about springs being climate refugia, where like as climate changes, there'll be a little bit of a buffer around those spring sites and protect the area for just a little bit longer. Next slide. So now I'm just gonna show you some fun pictures of things that we've caught on cameras at springs. Um, so has anyone seen these before out there? Yeah. Yeah, so these are kawatis. Um, they're actually a species that comes from down in Central America. There's four total species, but we only have one that makes it all the way up here. Next slide. This is actually a mountain lion at the same spring, you can see, kind of uh, right behind the prickly pear there. Next slide. Ooh. One of our skunks. <laughs> yeah, have, does anyone know how many species of skunks we have here in Arizona? <laughs> We actually have four different species of skunk. Yeah, hooded, spotted, striped, and hawk-nosed. Oh, and what's I that guy's I'm not actually totally sure. Our wildlife specialist is really good at skunk IDs. She can tell a skunk like from like three hairs on the tail. It's amazing. What's that guy? I think it's a hawk-nosed one, but I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not okay. an expert in this. It is a little pointy nose. Uh, but yeah, nice slide. Pretty. Um, so here's just some more pictures. What about that one on the upper left? Does anyone know what that one might be? Oh, my God. Is it Ringtail cat? Ringtail oh, cat, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. They do have stripes, but they're a little bit, um, they're more muted than the dark ones. They're more muted. Yeah. How about in the middle one? Does anyone recognize that one? That one's not hard to tell. Which one? The middle one in the top. Yeah, I think it's a rover there. Yeah, it's a rover there. Yeah. And then we have we have deer on the upper right, some kind of brown squirrel or something in the bottom right, another kind of deer in the middle, and then um, it's kind of hard to tell on that bottom one. It's like a cat. It's kind of hard to tell on the screens. The, the but, uh, but yeah, so we get all sorts of, of pictures of wildlife at these spring sites. Next slide. And here are photos that some of our spring seekers took actually when they were out there in the field. So everything like woodpeckers, snakes of various kinds, including the rock rattlesnake, which is one of our more rare rattlesnakes. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see an image of a bear actually wobbling in a spring, and then some of its tracks there on the bottom left. So we find we get a lot of bears that we get to see as well, which is cool. Next slide. And just, okay, I'll just picture pretty pictures because it's fun. I cannot tell you what types of moths and butterflies these are, but <laughs> we have one guy uh, who absolutely adores invertebrates and uh, always, whenever we're on a spring trip together, will identify every single bug that he sees, and it's, it's pretty cool. I wish I had that level of knowledge. <laughs> All right, next slide. 
All right, so in terms of threats to springs, about 90% of spring habitat has been lost since the mid-1800s, and that's a lot. Um, the main threats are groundwater overdrafting and then development, just because people are pulling more water out of the ground. Um, grazing and trampling can be a problem, although I have seen a number of springs that have been developed very thoughtfully to provide water for cattle and then also protect where the water is coming out for the native species there. Um, pollution, climate change, invasive species are all big threats. And then lack of information on springs locations and conditions is kind of the biggest threat right now. We don't even really know for sure that those 4,000 sites are really where they are. So next slide. <clears throat> the other things that um, have happened recently in our region that are threatening springs right now include things like the Bighorn Fire. Was anyone here in 2020 in mm -hmm. Tucson? Yeah, mm -hmm. so you probably all remember basically the whole sky being just fiery. Um, it was, as a native Tucsonan, it was very, very uh, just heartbreaking to see the mountains burning. Um, it was a huge fire and it burned most of the Catalinas. Uh, the challenge when it comes to springs, as you can see in the next slide, is it also came through and burned a number of different spring sites. So this is Annabelle Spring, you can't even really tell that it's a spring right now because just everything got burned. Next slide. Is that a recent <coughs> picture, that one? Or is that yeah, go back one. Picture? So this is from this is from 2020, so this is oh, shortly okay. after the fire. Yeah, so that's so the next slide. Um, this is a place that actually has had a little bit more regrowth. So this one is 2021. And so you can see that the spring, where the spring is, you can kind of see like the extent of the flowers is where the spring water has really managed to get those plants to come back. Next slide. <coughs> so some risks to springs from fire include burial of the spring itself. So if there's like a landslide after the fire, it can just bury the spring and then the spring won't come back anymore. Um, you can also have the opposite problem where you have erosion of the various channels um, around the spring and that can cause issues with how the water is flowing and how it's emerging. When you have a big fire, it also changes the way that water sinks into the ground. And so for the long term, you actually have just more runoff instead of more water sinking into the ground. And that's a problem long term for spring water flow. You can lose a lot of plants and animals. Like you saw that Annabelle Spring photo was just completely torched. Uh, you lose more water, there's problems with clogging of debris, and of course, the loss of cultural sites around springs. Next slide. So here's just an example in the Cherokee Mountains after the Horseshoe 2 fire, which I think was 2011. I'm not sure if anyone remembers that one. Um, but you can see this big, big landslide that happened because all of these trees died and we're no longer holding on to that material. Next slide. Um, but the springs actually are doing okay. So the, on the left side, Chiricahua Mountain Spring, uh, Anita Spring in the Chiricahua Mountains. Um, there's still water there. You can see a lot of the downed debris after that fire, um, but it is still flowing. And hopefully that's the case for the other springs in that area. And then Flicker Spring in the Catalina Mountains on the right side also burned, uh, but is, is looking like it's recovering as well. Slide. And here's an example of a site that is in the Pinaleniums, but as you can kind of see in the foreground, there's all the dock and the trees that didn't burn, and then the background is all burnt, right? So the hypothesis here is that this particular spring actually prevented the burning of this area, because the fire came in, and there was extra moisture in this area, and it led to these, this site not actually burning, which is really lucky. Next slide. And here's just one more example of a spring after fire. Um, the spring is kind of hard to tell, Gavel. But in the very center, like right there, um, there is a little trough, um, and that trough is where the spring is. And you can kind of see how it's all green just right around there, right? And then the other hillsides are pretty bare. So these springs are becoming places that are recolonizing the surrounding area with plants. They're helping the area recover after the fire. Next slide. Great. So one of the projects that we're actually wrapping up right now, we did a bunch of work at all of these springs that are in the burned area of the Catalinas. Um, so we took data that people have brought us in the Spring Seeker program, and we turned it around into how do we protect these sites and how do we um, make sure that water is available for wildlife. So we're doing a write-up on that right now, and if you are interested, it will end up on our website. Next slide. Um, just some examples from that project. We installed a trough on Cascade Spring, and then we did erosion control work in the Sigma Spring, all to kind of create these pools that you see which are beneficial for wildlife in the area. Next slide. 
we did some planting as well, um, trying to kind of keep the actual sediment and soil on the land instead of it washing off. And next slide. Um, right, so that's one of our restoration projects. I do want to talk a little bit more about the monitoring project that helped us, helped alert us to some of these fire problems at some of these springs. So the best thing to do if you're interested in springs is to join the Spring Seeker program. So what this is, is basically a program where you go out and if you get to a spring, you answer a few questions on your smartphone. It's just an app that runs on your phone. And then I get a report on that. And if you say, wow, this site got really burned and we might want to do restoration work there, then I know about it and then we can apply for funding and we can do that. So I'm gonna next talk a little bit more about the Spring Seeker program. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. So this is a bilingual app. Um, you only need your smartphone and hopefully a charge to your smartphone because I know sometimes they run out of battery. Um, and it takes, I would say, 10 to 15 minutes once you kind of know the questions. So if you're thinking you're out there and you're going to take a break in the spring, it's a perfect opportunity to contribute data to the Spring Seeker program. Next slide. Um, on our website, we have step-by-step -step instructions for how to start. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, you can check out our map where you can see the sites that have been surveyed. Those are all of the red circles. And then the darker blue circles, like I said, are all the ones that where we have natural springs. Next slide. The survey goes through step by step and it talks about water. So it says how much water is there? Um, is it actively flowing or is it just wet right now? Because a lot of times we'll go to a spring and it's like a mud puddle and it's kind of disappointing, but it's still, it's still useful for some wildlife. The survey asks about plants, animals, human use, impacts from livestock, wildfire, or invasive species, like I've talked about. And then it even asks you questions about what's the best way to get there? Did you struggle to get here? Did you go bushwhacking for four miles and then you found there was a road right to the site? That happens a lot. So uh, if we ever want to go back, we want that information as well. Um, yeah, so almost every photo in this presentation, except for the ones that I just showed of the spring work that we've done, came from Spring Seekers who submitted uh, photos along with the, the survey. It's not required, one photo is required, sort of as like proof of water, and you usually put your backpack in it so that you can get a sense of how big the, or, or your horse maybe, I don't know, uh, <laughs> to see how big the water source is. Um, but other than that, it's every other photo is just kind of prompted if you have, if you have the time and then the ability to take more photos. Next slide. So one thing I will say, I don't know if um, like what types of, if you guys have an app that you use to navigate when you're doing trail rides or anything, um, but one thing I have found is that some springs are not in the right place, even on the official maps. Um, so there's somebody who reported a spring somewhere, but it's in the wrong drainage, or it's in the wrong place in the drainage. It could be 500 feet off, it could be you know, 1,200 feet off, or it could be right on the spot. So that is one thing to be aware of, and probably you're used to that by planning multi-day rides, you know, making sure that there's enough water. Um, I don't know how that works for your organization, but um, for springs, it's definitely a challenge when you're out there and you're trying to find the site. Uh, you kind of have to, you go off your map, but then at a certain point you just have to look around and say, all right, where's the spring? So, next slide. <laughs> if you can't um, find it on your map with the point that's there, there are other clues. So for instance, this is a site in the Galliero Mountains where um, you can kind of see the clustering of the green plants in there. Um, so those are actually two springs. They both are about at the same elevation because the geology changes about there. And so from across the drainage, you can look over there and you can say, oh, perfect. I know where that spring is regardless of where it is on my map. Um, but I do like to warn people before they start going out with the Spring Seeker program that our data points are only as good as the data that we were given. So uh, if, you, you know, if you find a spring and it's in a different place, then we update the map, which is pretty cool. Next slide. So some other clues that you can do when you are out there, um, you can look for that riparian vegetation, not just that cluster of that darker green um, plants, but specifically in that right-hand side, we have conwoods and sycamores, which are changing colors with the seasons. Um, or if you're going out this time of year, it looks like a whole bunch of dead trees, right? Because they lost all their leaves. Um, so that can be really helpful uh, to find springs. On the left-hand side, there's a plant called sepolo, which is kind of hard to distinguish in this particular photo, but um, it's a kind of brushy plant that's about this tall, sometimes much taller, um, that is very indicative of water. So in this case, the water is seeping out kind of between those rocks. Next slide. 
Other examples we were talking about at dinner, how it seems like there are troughs and tanks and piping in the middle of nowhere. Uh, people, if there was a spring, people have probably found it in the past and have developed it in some way, um, either prehistorically or recently more, more historically. Um, so if you are walking up a drainage and you see piping or you start to see concrete, it's a clue that there's probably a spring somewhere in that drainage. Now people would move water for miles in the past, right? So there might be miles and miles of piping before you get to the spring. Um, but there is an indication that, that, that is a, there's a spring in that drainage. Next slide. Um, and here's an example from a recent site that I went to where it didn't look like much but what I'm actually standing on there and then kind of up against the rock is actually concrete that's been flooded over and over again and has been totally busted out by flash floods. And so you can tell there that like, even though there's not really obviously concrete these days, that there is evidence that there was a spring there in the past. And when I was there at this particular site, the rock was all seeping. And so they probably built a little dam to collect some of that water over time. Next slide. Um, some other examples, you probably have all seen uh, mineral stains on the rock. Uh, so even if it's not actively wet, it still might indicate that there is water in that area at least part of the year. Next slide. Right. So our current campaign, which any of you would be welcome to join. Um, I don't know a lot about the rules of um, where you can and can't ride. Um, do you know, can you, you can all ride in the wilderness areas, right? Yes. You know, okay, fantastic. So our current campaign is actually to survey springs in wilderness areas. And so we have these eight wilderness areas around Southern Arizona. So farthest north is Santa Teresa's and the Galleros. And then around Tucson, we have the Push Ridge and then the Rincon Mountain um, that's right around Tucson. And then further south in the Santa Rita's, we have Mount Wrightson uh, in the Atascosas in the far, far corner down there on the left the Pajarita Wilderness, um, then over towards Sierra Vista, the Miller Peak Wilderness and the Huachucas, and then in the Chiricahuas, which one, two, three, four, I think was not on this slide. So the Chiricahuas also. Um, so we are starting a campaign. Our first weekend is March 8th through 10th, um, where we're going out and we are serving the springs in the wilderness. So if that's your thing, check, check us out and sign up for one of those weekends. Or if you want to schedule your own trip to go out and ride and actually look at some of these springs, that would also be amazing. Next slide. So once we get that spring seeker data, um, like I said, we have some springs rescue projects that we've done before. Um, we also advocate for spring protection, either with ADEQ or with um, private landowners, although most private landowners are actually already very much in favor of spring protection. It's awesome to work with those folks. Um, and so then we can turn that around and we can say, okay, this site could really use a wildlife friendly fence or it could use a trough for cattle over here so that we can protect this area for the native species that grow here. Um, so that's the kind of project that we then undertake with that spring seeker data. Next slide. And then just one last point, um, spring seeker is just one tiny piece of what's going on in Arizona around water. Um, so the watershed management group, I don't know if you all have had a speaker from them yet, they're awesome. Um, they do a program where they go out and they are trying to understand where rivers are running. And so they ask that you go to the same place every day for 365 days to see where the water is running, like along the Rito, along the Sabino, um, Sabino Canyon, that kind of thing. Um, similarly, ADEQ actually runs their Arizona Water Walk where they do wet dry mapping. So that I can see as a great opportunity as well if you're riding along a sandy wash or something like that, and you see, oh, it's wet here and it's dry here, that's the information that they're really interested in. Um, and then I just want to give a pitch for the Land Snails of Arizona project because the snail guy is really cool um, and he looks for spring snails all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that's all. Like, next slide. Yeah, that's all I've prepared. I just wanted to talk a little bit about springs and about the program, but I do really want to leave time for questions. So I don't know if people have questions about the project itself. Um, or how to join or any of that, I'd be happy to do that now. Yeah. Well, we ride through, from your explanation, a spring right out of Caliente wash. I believe it. That has just come up. And we thought it was coming from the water from Ava Caliente, but your explanation means that it's a spring. It is a spring, yes. And you so, especially, I haven't been to that site, um, but especially those the, the sandy washes 
those springs can really move around. No, it's not so even sandy. Wash, it's a tree. It's on oh. the side of the wash almost, and it's been flowing for what, five Three or six years? years? Maybe five years. Yeah, well, that's and it's, exciting. Got, it's got water <laughs> year round on it. That's great. So is it along, along Agua Caliente? Caliente? Where yeah. along Agua Caliente? Well, you go up Agua Caliente wash going east off of so this trail. Okay. And you get to the tree prospect. Prospect is between the spot. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we rode through it the last oh, we yeah. did the neighborhood ride, and, and That's great. it was pretty. It's wet. probably pretty wet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the back is a spring, hundred percent. Yeah, if there is water coming up from the ground, it is a spring, especially here in Arizona. <laughs> okay. Yep. We recently had a Dollar General build in our community in uh, Mescal, Benson area, mm -hmm. and between the neighbor. And the Dollar General, there is a natural spring. Oh, so cool. when they built that store, they were not allowed to go like over that spring. The, that's great. Yes, that's it's good. really so they cool. still maintained the actual spring. Yes. The spring flow. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. It is. Good. <laughs> well, I'll show you. Find a spring and report it. You <laughs> also want, um, want you to do a lot of coordinates. Yeah, so the app so itself. Yeah, the app itself will guide you through that. So the first couple questions say, you know, site name, if you know it. If you don't, or if you're like, new site that just appeared, that's also fine to add. Um, and then you push a little button, and it grabs your latitude and longitude, and it saves it for you. So you don't have to open a different app or, or anything like that. So yeah. Oh, that's easy. Yeah. Yeah, the tool is really, really nice. It's just a, an easy, to, fairly easy to use smartphone app. There was a glitch last year where it didn't accept photos for six months, which was nightmarish, but that's fixed now. Yeah. So. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, it really, it's amazing. Um, I'll send some follow-up, just some links for people that are interested, because it's a lot easier than, you know, taking pictures of a, of a PowerPoint or anything. Um, so I'll send some links to Sue, and then um, maybe you can circulate those if anyone wants to join the program. Awesome. Fantastic. Cool. Well, thank you all very much.